this was another question that was submitted for tonight. And let me first kind of summarize what the question is asking, and then we can talk about our next steps. Uh, this, this particular question, oh, also taking as a heads up, there's a somewhat similar topic that we'll be talking about on Thursday, but just like with Malik, I thought that there was enough kind of differences between this question and the Thursday question that it was worthwhile to also kind of address this individually. But we'll probably save some of the topics for Thursday uh, to split things up at least a little bit. So for this question, what it's asking for is a serialization function, a function that takes in a C structure and as output, a byte array. And this is a fairly common sort of operation when we're trying to send data between different processors. It might be different processors on the same system, or it might be different processors connected by some sort of a network. Because this structure, and we haven't defined what this structure is, but this structure may not have the same meaning on a different system. Or maybe they say that differently. If we recall from Sunday's session, we talked about alignment requirements for processors and how padding is added between fields and in between or after the structure, essentially. Alignment is added based on the needs of that particular architecture. So some architectures might require uh, everything to be aligned per the size of the field. So a two byte field needs to be two byte aligned and a four byte field needs to be four byte aligned. But other systems might not have such requirements or might even have more stringent requirements. So that's one reason why we can't simply take the structure and send it out over the network. Uh, another reason why this might be necessary is if we have fields within our structure that don't have a consistent length between different systems. So for instance, something like size T or the one I keep using, int pointer. This might be eight bytes on a, on a 64-bit system but it's likely only going to be four bytes on a 32-bit system. So if our two processors have different word lengths, these data types have different lengths themselves, will consume different number of bytes in memory. So when we try and send them out on the wire, the interpretation that the recipient has may be different than the interpretation, the intended interpretation by the center. So anyways, a whole host of reasons why just providing a structure isn't, doesn't always work out well, especially for a arbitrary structure. So serialization is a big thing. And there's a lot of other reasons why, I just gave you reasons why you couldn't use a structure. There's other reasons why you might want to use serialization in terms of a benefit, uh, whether it be error handling or doing forward and backward compatibility of different versions of messages, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, lots of good reasons to do serialization. And this, this question is asking you to implement a serialization function. And every serialization function, once again, needs to have some sort of input that's going to be something meaningful to the current system. And then an output byte array and presumably some sort of length for how many bytes are going to be allocated. Uh, in this case, it's the maximum size of the array. This problem, as it's stated right here, is missing, I would say, two very important pieces of information. And I don't, I don't know when this question was submitted if they were intentionally left out or if it was unintentional. But the first thing that this question is leaving out is what is this order batch structure. It doesn't actually define what that is. That, how do I serialize something if I don't have it? So I actually went online to see if this was some sort of a common question, and I found one potential implementation of order batch. For the sake of this question, it doesn't really matter what order batch is because we do the same thing regardless. But let's say just for the sake of argument that here is our order batch structure. It has an ID, a timestamp, 
and then some number of orders where each order has an order ID, a quantity, a part number, and an email address. So just for the sake of argument, let's say that this is what it is that we want to serialize. The second thing that wasn't defined in, part, in, in this prompt is what is the serialization form? What is the wire format? What, what form is this supposed to look like? There is a multitude of ways that we could go about doing this. And maybe this question was intentionally open-ended and it was up to us to design the serialization method. Or it's possible that as part of this question, you are given a serialization format and required to use it. For the sake of our discussion right now, let's just take a really simple, let's think of like the simplest serialization method possible. And let's think of it as, as essentially a packed struct. Let's take each one of these fields and copy them in the output in such a way that there is no padding between one field and the next and where pointers are essentially dereferenced. For instance, this order contains a pointer to an email address. We want to place within our structure, within our output, the actual email address that this pointer is pointing to. So once again, if, if you were just to call memcopy order into out, what you would see is a pointer being placed in the out. But sending a pointer across the internet isn't going to do much good. We need to send the actual email address. So let's say this is our serialization method. We're going to have no padding between entries. Uh, we will uh, dereference and copy the true value behind any pointer. And finally, arrays are, or well, arrays slash lists, I suppose is the better way of putting it, are in order. In other words, this right here, I presume, is a list of orders, which in fact, this probably needs the next pointer then, oops. Let's assume that has a next for the sake of this argument as well. Uh, this, is, this is gonna be a linked list of all the orders. So we need to loop over that linked list and then process each one of those orders consecutively. So we're gonna process our linked list and our arrays in order and copy those into our output. Any questions so far about this problem statement? And any of those assumptions that I, well, not assumptions, any of those requirements I just made up. Glenn, what do you do with the outmax length? So, for example, if your serialized <clears throat> output is greater than outmax length, do you truncate it or do you? Excellent question. And once again, this doesn't actually define it. Uh, I would say a reasonable approach would be if the, if we get to a point where we're trying to serialize a message and we do not have enough bytes to serialize the entire order, then what we should return is some sort of an error. And in, in my, my kind of my practical experience, uh, sending, sending just part of the data you want is just as bad as sending random data or invalid data because it makes the other side inconsistent with your view on the world. So probably better to return an error if you don't have enough bytes, as opposed to trying to do some sort of special handling out of it. Thanks, thanks. That's just my, my two cents. Obviously, uh, different arguments could be had, and this particular question doesn't preclude one way of doing it versus the other. Uh, let's see. So uh, I'm not going to implement everything here, but let's just look at this a little bit. Uh, First and foremost, we need to keep track of where we are in our output. So we're gonna have some sort of, let's call it an, well, two approaches. We can either modify our output or we can keep track of some sort of index into our output. 
both those approaches are valid. I personally like using an index, but sometimes it's nice to be able to refer back to what's going on. So what I'll probably have is a, uh, let's just say a uint32 index that starts off with zero. And now every time that I want to refer to output, what I'll do now is do something like out index. So I'll treat my byte, my byte, my uh, my output pointer uh, as truly a byte array. And then uh, just to start off with order batch, these first couple fields are pretty straightforward. I like using mem copy for every single field that we're trying to copy. I uh, we, we talked a little bit on Sunday about how mem copying can be used for type punning and how I think that even outside the context of type punning, mem copy ends up being the clearest solution for the job. Uh, so obviously we could just uh, write the data over as a 64-bit integer, uh, but I prefer to do mem copy. So we're gonna mem copy into our output array at index. It's going to be coming from uh, our order batch uh, ID. And then we'll want to have size of order batch ID. So we're just going to mem copy the first field directly into our output. And then we need to increase our index by eight bytes in this case. Or we could also potentially do even better would be plus equals size of order batch ID. Hopefully you all can see that this particular, these particular two lines would then be duplicated again for the timestamp. So ID and timestamp are gonna be handled very similarly this way. And now these next two are essentially gonna be a, a for loop. So we will have four uh, struct order, order equals, order batch orders, uh, order, let's see, I may have to change this later on, order does not equal null, and order equals order next. Oh, you know, oh, sorry, I actually, uh, I was treating this as a linked list, although I just realized there was an order count right here. Uh, so maybe we could have instead done this as a for int i equals zero, i is less than order count i plus plus. I was reading over this too quickly and totally missed out on the fact that this is an array, not a linked list. So we can, we can kind of just, uh, ignore these two lines. So within our for loop, we were essentially doing the exact same mem copy and index handling that we were before. We do a mem copy. Oops, sorry, now we can't go a little bit further out. There we go. We do a mem copy for out index. This is why I like doing it this way, was that everything now is always mem copying into out. Uh, and we never have to worry about exactly where we're copying to as the index kind of continues to increase. And we're gonna be copying from, in this case, order batch orders index i. And we're gonna be taking the, in this particular case, uh, order, ID field, and I realize we should probably be using size of, but let's just use eight for simplicity right here, and then index plus equals eight. So now we have just 
hand or oops, I can handle our order ID. We would do the exact same thing with quantity in the eight byte, eight, sorry, the one byte field. Uh, this part number, we would do the exact same thing as well. We'll just copy that all 16 bytes together at the same time into our output. And then the only real complication here is where we want to copy the email address over. Uh, what we would probably do in that case is rather than using memcopy, we would probably use stircopy since there doesn't appear to be a length associated with that character pointer. Stir copy into out index uh, and uh, whatever that happens to end up being the something email address. And that's all within our for loop. The one thing, one thing uh, as I think Manish asked earlier, uh, and we want to make sure we catch, and so far we haven't done any of this, is we need to make sure we don't exceed our, out, our, our maximum length here. So for each one of these steps above, where we are doing a mem copy and incrementing our index, what we need to be doing right beforehand is check uh, index, essentially in this case, plus eight will be less than our out max length. So before every single mem copy, we need to check whether or not we have enough space to do that operation. Assuming we do have space the entire time, we, we, copied, we copied all the things we had up here in the order batch. We then have our, our for loop to copy all the things from our order. Everything's going into out. Once we've all, once we've concluded this processing, we're, we're done essentially. And in the context of this function, all we have to do is return. Uh, obviously the serialized order function would probably be uh, soon followed off to by some sort of pipe write or some sort of send operation to actually send this data to the recipient side. And I wanna talk a little bit about variants of this, but first any, hopefully the code I have here isn't overly complicated, but any questions about what I was doing here in terms of mem copying and keeping an index? So, uh, so Glenn, Glenn, the thing is, we did not talk about uh, the uh, host to network order. So we are assuming that both the machines are of the same endedness. Um, and um, I, when when I, when I looked at the problem the first time, I thought it's the classic uh, type length value kind of uh, serialization. Uh, but I think I think this is much more efficient. Uh, I'm just wondering th that if if the same format was not there, like struct order batch was not there, defined on the other side that is receiving, then it would be quite difficult to parse it. But I think in an interview context, this is a very good solution, I think. Yeah, so you bring up two excellent, excellent points. The first is, uh, is endianness. And you're absolutely right. I totally ignored endianness here. Maybe that was a safe thing to do. Maybe it wasn't. We talked in Sunday about how we have this network byte order. Uh, and in theory, everything sent out over the network would be in network by order, and then each individual host can can convert or not convert as needed to that network by order. Uh, we could potentially do that exact same thing here as well. We could look up whether or not our current system is little endian or big endian, and if we're little endian, we could convert everything, each one of these fields, we could convert to big endian before placing it in this output buffer. Uh, and, and I'll also keep in mind that we don't, when we use the word network by order, that doesn't actually mean everything over the network has to be in big end the end. Uh, protocol buffers, for example, is a, a great serialization library and it puts everything in little endian format. Uh, so if you're on a big end, you actually will convert to little endian in order to send it out over the network. Uh, but in any case, you're absolutely right that we probably did need to, we, we probably needed to ensure endianness was correct. Uh, and if it isn't going to be the same on both ends, then do this conversion if needed. So excellent point. Uh, I will stand corrected that that is at least something that needs to be mentioned. At the beginning, when you start implementing this, 
uh, you would need to potentially state any sort of assumptions that you're making. So you might say, oh, I'm assuming that the Indianness is going to be the same on both ends. And the interviewer can then correct you if your assumption, if, if the, the stated assumption that you're making is not a reasonable assumption to make in the context of the interview. Uh, so that, that's a fantastic point. Thanks for catching that. Thanks for keeping me honest. Uh, the second, your second point, which is you mentioned uh, type length value, I believe is the word, word you used. And you're absolutely right. What I did here was I would say the one of, if not the simplest ways of serializing something, which, well, other than this Indian mist thing, I'm reasonably confident would work fine. Uh, I, I can't see any reason why this wouldn't work. Uh, yes, we would need to have the same structure on the other side, but that, that's kind of a necessity regardless. Like we're sending data. The other side needs to know what data we're sending. Uh, it, it's, it's reasonable to assume that they have either the same structure or an equivalent structure if, for example, they're using a different programming language uh, to receive it. So on that side, there's not a problem. But there are a lot of good reasons why you'd want to use something more like type length field for sending data over a network. Uh, I mentioned a couple of them earlier in passing, but let's say hypothetically, a couple of years down the line, we have a whole bunch of systems running over the network. Uh, maybe we don't even control all of these systems ourselves, and they're all running this serialization method with these structures. Let's say in the future, we've decided, you know what? This quantity, someone at one point tried to order 257 items. And because we only had an 8-bit quantity field, we weren't able to support 257 of them. And we've decided that the solution we want to take is to change this from an 8-bit field to a 16-bit field. With the serialization technique I've taken here, this change wouldn't be possible. We wouldn't be able to change the number of bytes that a field consumes because the person on the other end has an assumption that it is still the same eight bytes. Or vice versa, if the recipient has the new 16-bit interpretation and the sender has the eight-bit value, then the recipient is going to incorrectly parse the received message. And the same exact problem happens as well as we wanted to add a new field. Uh, let's say uh, we wanted to also add a phone number into this order in addition to the email address, for instance. Currently, this order is in an array and in the wire format, each one of those entries in the array are exactly adjacent to the one before and after it. So if you started adding new fields in the middle, it would mess up your, your, uh, your parsing of that structure. So those are some examples of things that we can't do with this. But if we instead had, as was just mentioned, a type length uh, value, and there's a couple of different variants of this. Uh, I think maybe another way of looking at it is, maybe you were getting at this as well, is instead ID length value, where each field in your message has an ID associated with it. So the order ID is has ID one, quantity is ID two, part number is ID three, and email address is ID four. And then every, oops, then our encoded message, what it ends up looking like is something like that in terms of what that output wire format looks like. For each field in our message, we have the unique identifier for that field, the length in terms of bytes that that field 
uh, contains. And then, once again, this is the actual data associated with order ID. Uh, maybe it's order ID 10, maybe timestamp is uh, some random number. And now what that means is that if in the future we wanted to change timestamp from eight bytes to 16 bytes, all we would need to do is change that we were sending 16 bytes instead. And now it becomes clear within the message how many bytes each field consists of. And the recipient <clears throat> uh, will know at that point to start expecting 16 bytes because the length field was accordingly 16 bytes. Uh, and along the same lines, we could add a new field. We could add a new field here in the middle, uh, field three with our, our phone number. And we could, we could place that right there in the middle of our encoded message. And on the recipient side, on the parsing side, if for instance, we weren't aware of field ID three, we didn't realize the phone number field was there, we could just skip right over that field and go on to the next one and no harm, no foul. So this ID length value or some variant thereof is a fantastic solution to some of the problems that we brought up just a second ago. Uh, with regards to the, the serialization method that I initially defined. Uh, whether you go with my initial method, whether you do something more complicated like using ID length value is going to depend, well, in part on how much time you have, but most is going to depend on what sort of constraints you're given by the interviewer. If the interviewer gives you literally just this problem with no other additional information, then well, you might as well take the simpler approach. There's no reason to over-engineer something if you don't need to. But if they, if they tell you that it needs to be backward and forward compatible or have, it, it requires to supporting some of the things that this implementation would not, then the ID length value approach should be the approach to take. Uh, this, this, for in exact, this ID length value is exactly the approach we're going to talk about on Thursday for one of the assignment problems. Uh, so this is going to go directly into that topic. And we're going to go into more detail and talk about at least one, if not two, specific ways of serializing that take, take advantage of this approach. Uh, but I thought it was worthwhile to at least talk about one simple approach that you could potentially take. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, no, excellent, excellent points there. Uh, any other questions here? <clears throat> and I guess just to say that one more time, if you're given a kind of a, a potentially a big problem, like implement malloc or implement a serialization mechanism, and you only have 30 minutes to do it, and in a typical interview, you at most is going to be an hour long, and there's probably going to be some other questions that are being asked and talked about. So you might only have 30 minutes, 40 minutes to actually do your design and implementation. You want to be conscious of that when you're trying to figure out what your design you, you want to come up with is, because you could have a fantastic design, but if the interviewer is expecting you to complete your implementation in half an hour, and you only get through... I don't know, half of your implementation, a tenth of your implementation, because you you design you over-designed it. it. Not that that's always a bad, a bad thing, but it's at least potentially bad if you didn't set out to achieve what the interviewer asked you to do, which was give me something that'll work within half an hour. Uh, so it's worth keeping that in mind, not just for this order batch, not just for Malik, but questions in general of, of how complicated your solution, your design is going to be to implement. Uh, it's always possible to implement at first a relatively simple design and then talk about how you might add to it or expand to it or change it if you had these other requirements that came in. Um, hey, Glenn, I had a quick question. So there are these um, serializers like NanoPB and all those things. Uh, so what uh, in their implementation, I know that's very elaborate and extensive, but is that typically this ID and value kind of approach implementation or is it uh, otherwise? Yeah. <laughs> no, so I, uh, nano PB, well, P protocol buffers in general, for first to say, I think is a fantastic tool. And I think it's probably one of the best examples 
of this sort of thing out there. There's some great documentation for it. It actually is pretty simple. Uh, the actual implementation of protocol buffers, the serialization and deserialization is pretty simple. Uh, the language, the ideal language that you use to write this out is fairly simple. Uh, so if, if you're trying to learn about serialization techniques, I would absolutely recommend reading up on protocol buffers. And NanoPB is probably the simplest implementation of protocol buffers out there. Uh, and I, I, I will be actively referring to NanoPB on Thursday. So uh, it's definitely my favorite too. NanoPB ends up being a little bit interesting in that it's not ID length value. Well, it's it kind of is, but it's actually just ID value. But where ID is two parts, it's both your ID number and it's a a type. And a type might be something like a float or a variable, uh, variable length integer or a fixed integer. And there's some other types, but I think there's seven or eight types as well, including string. Uh, so your ID is both the field ID as well as the type. And if your type is a dynamic length type, like a string, then there also is a length field added here. So you asked earlier whether or not is it is it ID length value? And the answer is kind of, except that length is sometimes not there. Uh, because if you know the size of the field in advance, such as an integer, uh, then they won't bother putting the length in the wire format. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we can spend a decent amount of time on Thursday talking about nano, or talking about p p protocol buffers specifically, and we'll see how much time we actually have. Uh, <clears throat> but that is that is I think a, a fantastic thing to, to spend some more time talking about. Uh, but implementing implementing protocol buffers, or even implementing uh, an an ID length value sort of approach in the context of a, of a thirty minute interview is probably not feasible. Uh, like th there's, there's just a lot of code involved to make that work generally. And even if you were given a specific set of structures like this, actually, I'd have to sit down and actually try and implement it to see how long it would take me. Uh, but at least at first glance, it seems like it's the kind of thing that uh, might take too long to implement. Uh, but you know, that'll be a good exercise for me. It'll be a good exercise for you all as well, is try and implement this using a, a, a type uh, or a, an ID length value sort of sort of tuple approach. And we can see how long it takes us all. 